Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Barry Gray in the WMCA studios in New York. In a moment, we're going to join our listeners in Buffalo on WBNY. Tonight's broadcast brought to you by Sauce Arturo, the Whitestone Press, Nat Sherman Cigars and Cigarettes. The Dandy Mattress Company presents the news, Northwest Orient Airlines, the Comer Marcus Company, Zion Kosher Meat Products, Sweet Touchney Tea, Empire Furniture Factories, Fieldston Green Apartments, and Stumer's Bread. And now once again, Barry Gray on WMCA New York, and as of this instant, we're live on WBNY in Buffalo, another member of the Strauss Broadcasting Group. Tonight, as a matter of fact, in just a moment or two, I'll be talking with Dick Powell, who's reporting from Hollywood via our Strauss Beeper phones. Then I'll be talking in the studio to Malcolm X. He is the leader of the nationalist Negro movement known as the Muslims, and Mr. X early this morning met with Cuba's Fidel Castro here at the Hotel Teresa in New York. Let me meet now Mr. Malcolm X, leader of the nationalist Negro movement known as the Muslims, who early this morning met at the Hotel Teresa in Harlem with uh, Fidel Castro. You would call that a, an accurate description of the group and the day's events? Uh, most inaccurate. Go ahead. Uh, Straighten me out. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Gray. And uh, I would like to point out that when you refer to us or to me as the leader of the black nationalist uh, Negro group in Harlem, n known as the Muslims, I don't think that you could say anything that would be farther from the truth. I didn't use the word black. I'll read it again. I said leader of the nationalist Negro movement known as the Muslims. Yes, well, that's worse yet. <laughs> well, that's me. I keep getting my foot in it. That's right. Uh, a Muslim, a nationalist, and I think you first should be... It should be explained to you the difference between a, new, a Muslim and a nationalist. Uh, the black nationalist, a Muslim, we're Muslims. And a Muslim is one who believes that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. We're not known as Muslims. We are Muslims. And uh, a nationalist usually uh, is a political uh, group uh, whose objective is the betterment of the black man, but usually they don't, they don't stress religion, they don't stress God, or, nor do they uh, stress moral reformation. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the one whom I represent, is the spiritual head of the fastest growing group of black Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. And by Muslims, we mean that uh, we are a religious uh, group. We believe in God. We believe in moral ref uh, reformation. And uh, as you probably recall, in the Time magazine a year ago in July, they referred to him as one of the greatest moral reformers who has ever appeared among the so-called Negroes because he has absolutely been successful in eliminating the uh, addiction to, of, uh, to dope, to tobacco, to alcohol. We're anti-alcohol, anti-tobacco, anti-dope, anti-adultery, anti-prostitution, uh, anti-stealing, anti-anything that's contrary to the law. So uh, I would like to make that point. We are a religious uh, group of Muslims. We are not, uh, as you would put it, uh, black nationalists. I didn't say black nationalists. Well, Negro nationalists. And Negro. there's no such thing as a Negro nationalist. A Negro never uh, thinks of his own kind to the extent where he has the spirit of nationalism. When a man begins to refer to himself as a nationalist, he, usually, he refers to himself as a black man. Mr. X, that was just what you've just said is just because of my introduction. I'm almost afraid to ask the first question. Yes, sir, but I mean, I wanted to straighten that out. because We may I be here till dawn. That's correct, <laughs> but I think it's better to be here uh, until dawn and have the correct uh, opinion of each other than to be misinformed. I have, uh, I take back the introduction, and you are the leader, the associate leader of what? I am Mr. Elijah Muhammad's representative or, or minister to the Muslims in the New York area, a religious uh, group who follows the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, Could I ask a question? Bob Sylvester, you certainly may if Mr. X doesn't, I, I think this is a very kind but you have to get on mic. Yeah. All right. Uh, we don't have booms. I would, like, I, you know, I would like to ask just a very, I hope, a very inoffensive and kind question. I have seen so. I'm very interested in jazz music, and I've seen so many, many jazz m musicians go to the trend of what they call Islamic. Is that yours? Uh, we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad abstain 
from the uh, show world or show business because usually to participate in that, you're surrounded by alcohol and you're surrounded by people who are drunk. You're surrounded by people who are out trying to have a good time. It's uh, an environment that can cause a lot of trouble. And when we follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we try to avoid trouble. And one of the best places to stay away from, if you want to avoid trouble, is nightclubs where people get drunk and usually don't know what they're doing yes. or what they're saying. And yet every one of, of the boys that I know that have, ter have gone to what they call Islamic do not drink, do not smoke. They do drink coffee, and they are very quiet. Is it the same? All Muslims are the same. A Muslim well, is all. a brother. I will, I will retire. Yeah, I was, I was no, interested. it's all right, Bob. Yeah. I, you said you made one statement, Mr. X. You said that uh, something about having a good time. I, I Would you just recall that for me a moment ago? Uh, no, you'll have to recall You're, you're not against having a good time, uh, are you? We're, we're not against having a clean good time. See, Mr. Muhammad emphasizes well, this cleanliness. this is all relevant, I think, yes, when you get is. into the word clean. Clean, yes. Well, it, it, it's a person's... Uh, some people have a different conception of clean, but we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad take it for exactly what it means. We try and clean ourselves up physically, morally, spiritually, and otherwise. Uh, isn't it true that a cafe singer named Roy Hamilton appeared at your Harlem Roundup recently? Yes, sir. Well, isn't he a nightclub entertainer? He sings in the nightclub. Well, you wouldn't decry his method we of earning a living. We don't decry his method of, of uh, earning a living. But I say we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to the best that we can avoid any involvement in any environment that's not conducive to good morals. And uh, we have many of our brothers who used to be in show business after they are in a, a position economically to leave it, they leave it. As you know yourself, most of our people, most of the so-called Negroes, who have become quite famous in, in show business usually die in poverty. Uh, they don't have That's a, not because of show business. No, it's not because of show business. It's because of the system. What system is that, Mr. X? This is way off our original discussion. I think we better get to no, our I, original I'm, discussion. No, I'm curious <laughs> is about the system. That what, what are we talking about now? Well, sir, you take uh, show business. Take, for instance, uh, they say that Ella Fitzgerald is the queen. Uh, but Ella Fitzgerald is, is uh, still struggling. Uh, take uh, Struggling for Struggling what? economically. Uh, wherein, I'll never know why. Wherein people who come along and imitate her go beyond her. They get television shows. They get, uh, they go forward. There are no barriers, no obstacles in their path. You're telling me now that there are barriers because Ella Fitzgerald is a Negro? Is she because she's non-white? I would say there are barriers, yes. Well, how about Harry Belafonte and Sammy Davis and Sidney Poitier? And They're in a category. I'd say that, uh, uh, Sammy Davis is in a unique category. He's a great uh, entertainer. All, That's why he's all, unique. All by himself. He's in a unique category all by himself. What about Sidney Poitier? He's in a unique category all by himself, and he's respected somewhat. Uh, I should say he's respected. But I think you'll find that many of the, of the so-called Negro uh, musicians or entertainers who have crossed the line marriage-wise, very seldom do you find their audience, uh, audiences uh, remain predominantly so-called Negro. Usually their, their billings or their dates or their uh, uh, schedules are they're more downtown or in white uh, theaters or nightclubs or theaters or nightclubs predominantly patronized by whites than among their own kind. For instance, uh, there are some so-called Negro entertainers who after undertaking a white wife, for instance, you could go all over Harlem and never find one of their records on the on the uh, Nickelodeon. Well, whose fault is that? Well, we're not. That's not the point. Uh, still, the point is, after they make such moves, uh, it affects them with their own people uh, more so than is commonly realized. Now, that's well, not dealing in any specific personalities, but I say. I, I don't know what this has got to do with our discussion. Well, you brought it up. No, you said that the system uh, created a great deal of. Uh, uh, anguish, I guess, is the word, that Ella Fitzgerald wasn't doing so no, well. The last time no. I looked, Ella Fitzgerald was the highest paid no, uh, I singer this, of her kind. No, I say this, Mr. Gray, that the majority of it, you can always pull out exceptions. Well, you named no, Ella no, Fitzgerald. No, 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 that's right, but still, you can always pull out exceptions, but the majority of the so-called Negro entertainers, whether it's in the actual field of music or whether it's in the field of sports, uh, like fighting, usually, uh, despite the amount of money, that they draw in at the gate, they end up in poverty. Well, that 
would be the fault of their economic advisors or their own bad inherent sense of business. You can't blame the system for that. When you... the, the, the system is responsible for their bad, as you call it, inherent uh, sense of business, the system, the environment under which they grow up, uh, uh, is responsible well, let for me, their bad sense of let me, uh, let me business. tell you about an example that perhaps you do not know, and perhaps I'm telling tales out of school because we are very good friends, but Sidney Poitier is a Negro actor of great stature and very widely respected. And Mr. Poitier, who is in his mid-30s, actually today will never have to work again if he doesn't care to because he's been so well advised and so well set up in a financial way that literally he will never have to work again if he doesn't wish to. Yes. Fortunately, he wishes to. Yes. Well, so w the responsibility of finding proper advisors would seem to be upon the performer. Uh, the public can't be blamed or the, the show business bookers can't be blamed because someone who earns five or ten or twenty thousand dollars a week uh, is not wise enough to entrust it to someone who is honest and gives good advice. And there are hundreds of such people around. All you have to do is find them. Yes, well, you find them, sir. <laughs> oh, I'd be glad to give you the name of a good business manager. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm not looking for one. I think I have the best business manager in the world, and that's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, if you, if you want to get to him... Do you have a statement of net worth with you so we can judge this? Sir? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a joke. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we get into the next uh, segment of this discussion, a, a brief reintroduction. I'm talking with Malcolm X. Uh, he is the, an associate of, the, of Elijah Muhammad the leader of the group known as the Muslims. Is that correct? He's the leader of the Muslims in the, the largest group of black Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. They're uh, not they... known as the Muslims. They are Muslims. Just like you're not known as Barry Gray, you are Barry Gray. You want to bet? Let's, uh, let's pause here for the news after this important minute in New York and in Buffalo. Ladies and gentlemen, in New York and in Buffalo, Mr. Malcolm X, representative of Muhammad Elijah, leader of the Muslim group, I guess in the United States. It's, it's a national movement. Elijah Muhammad. I'm sorry. The, the spiritual leader of the black Muslims in the Western Hemisphere. How many, such, how many members does he have or followers? Uh, I've never heard him say. Do you have any idea? No. Anybody who's in a position to know how many followers he has wouldn't say, and anybody who says is not in a position to know. Let me ask you, Mr. X, uh, why did you visit Fidel Castro this morning? Uh, well, you have to understand it like this. Uh, because of the climate that has been produced by the trouble in Africa, in the Congo, in Kenya, and other places, it has uh, caused a great deal of tension in Harlem. And uh, based on that, the, uh, some representatives from the 28th Precinct uh, a few weeks ago visited our restaurant, and we were, they were discussing these uh, incidents that stemmed, uh, the incidents that stemmed uh, from this tension, and they uh, asked us for suggestions on some of the best ways to combat it. So uh, we suggested that they, instead of condemning the uh, leaders of these different nationalist groups, that they get all of them together at the uh, Amsterdam News Office, where they have, they have the 28th Precinct Community Council at the Amsterdam News Office, I think it's once a month. So that they took this suggestion. And at this meeting about three or four weeks ago, uh, uh, a sort of a working unity was brought about by the editor of the Amsterdam News and Captain Noonan of the 28th Precinct and... Patrolman Sosis, who handles, I think, the public relations or something rather. So it was suggested that uh, working with just that element wasn't sufficient, but to get that element of leaders together with the civic leaders, the business leaders, and whatnot there in Harlem. So uh, last Friday, uh, a meeting was held at the Amsterdam News Office, presided over by James Hicks, the editor, and Captain Noonan and Sosis, and I think uh, Inspector Whalen uh, was there. And, and, and Lieutenant Seeley. Plus, there was Commissioner Dumson of the Department of Welfare and uh, Dr. Alfred Morrow, the ex-commissioner, and uh, John B. King, uh, Reverend Dempsey, the mayor on Harlem, Dr. Allen, Nathan Friedman, and Vernell uh, Pemberton, uh, assistants to the superintendent of districts, 
There was uh, Norman Saunders from the mayor's committee was there. and uh, I believe you, Mr. Well, Rex. all right. Go ahead. Uh, I want you to know who was there so you'll know why I was in Fidel Castro's room. Since you want to know, we'll get the details. Uh, so uh, one of the first things that was brought up at this meeting was that in, there were many African dignitaries being brought to America during the U.N. session and that these African dignitaries would want to visit Harlem. And the, the, the 28th Precinct, or the police department, was very concerned that there wouldn't be a repetition of the incident that took place when President Sekoutere of Guinea was there. So uh, uh, they were asking for suggestions, and it was brought out that one of the primary reasons that uh, this incident took place was because uh, uh, of improper representation of the, on the committee or whatever it was that brought him there. There was just one element involved in his bringing in the bringing of him there therefore it left a lot of dissatisfied elements and that those different ingredients caused a combustion of booing and so forth that was embarrassing so it was suggested that a committee be set up and this committee was supposed to be uh, uh, representative of all of the elements in Harlem the nationalist elements the Christian elements the fraternal elements the business elements and so forth and uh, uh, I was selected on that committee uh, to be responsible for representing and welcoming uh, any dignitary that came to Harlem. And when the meeting was breaking up, I asked Mr. Hicks about uh, how to form the thing together, and he said, well, since your name was mentioned, you take the initiative in getting the others together. So uh, then when Friday, when, uh, what night was that? The last night? Monday night. Monday, uh, Monday night, night uh, we heard that uh, Fidel Castro was coming to the Teresa, which was unbelievable. He so, had a do bill that didn't work at the Shelburne. Well, uh, that's what somebody said, but uh, I'm inclined not to go along with everything that I hear. Uh, so we went to the Teresa, and when we got there, the place was packed, jammed, right. and there was a lot of confusion and excitement. Now, I would like to state right here that one of the reasons that uh, we were selected, or the Muslims were selected to be represented on any committee that had anything to do with representing any dignitaries to Harlem, the police department recognizes the fact that, of all, that out of all of the groups in Harlem, those who are the most, you can't find a better disciplined group or a more, I don't care what propaganda you say about us, you can't find a more disciplined group or a, a group that's more law-abiding than the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and you can't find a group that's more co uh, cooperative with law enforcement officers. And so when this jam occurred there at the Teresa, the police officials, we could never have been in the Teresa had not the, po the police allowed us there. They put out the reporters. They put out everyone. But they uh, allowed us to stay there because uh, Inspector Whalen was at the meeting when this committee was set up. And since he's responsible for all of the safety of the dignitaries, I think in the 10th Division, he let the committee that was selected stay in the Teresa Hotel. Mr. X, I believe you. I still ask the question. I'm what giving you some background. I don't intend to leave anything out because I've had sufficient... We've only got two hours. I understand. We have other guests, Mr. X. All right. Uh, Democracy is one of the precepts of your organization. It is, sir. Free speech for everyone? Yes, sir. But you can take... Uh, see... I came because Mr. Kirschenbaum I've heard of him. told me that he wanted an ob objective report, and I don't think that I, uh, whenever you are, you are involved with a man as controversial as Dr. Castro and as controversial as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you don't just make statements that, aren't, that you don't explain because people take them and twist them and make more out of them I'm, than what you mean. I'm listening. Now, so uh, you were at the Teresa. So we left. After the, they had brought Dr. Castro in, we left. And then we re received a call at our restaurant at 116th and Lennox. I got to get that plug in. Best restaurant in New York. Uh, and uh, you'll pay for that, pal. <laughs> and they asked they asked us to come to the Teresa Hotel that that Dr. Castro wanted to see us. I was shocked. Yeah. And uh, but we got the committee together and went back. When we went back with the Muslims, the police led us through their lines. Right. We were led by them up to the ninth floor and into Dr. Castro's room. And uh, uh, he greeted us very cordially, and uh, uh, was the, he was he greeted us very cordially. We sat down. The room wasn't so big, and in, in fact, it was crowded with his own with his uh, entourage. And we were allowed to take in, I think, about five: two Negro reporters, and a, a, a cameraman, and four of the brothers. And uh, so that was that. 
Is there any difference between a Negro reporter and any other kind, Mr. X? If you go to Mississippi, there's a difference. And you don't have to go to Mississippi. You can go right here in New York. Yes, there is a difference, sir. You don't not to me. Don't ask me a question. I'm not, you're an individual. Don't ask me a question that you don't want a blunt answer from. Oh, yes, there I, is. Yes, I there ask, is a difference. And I'm Mr. surprised that Mr. you, Mr. Mr. X, when I ask a question, I expect an answer. Well, Mr. Gray, I'm I surprised. I expect a polite but, answer, but I expect an answer. Yes, sir. I'm surprised that you... Uh, a man as intelligent and experienced as you are and, no, in, and I, as informed as you are with world affairs well, should ask me, is there any difference between well, a Negro reporter and a see, white reporter? Mr. X, if, as a broadcaster, if for many, many years, I would never refer to a reporter as a Negro reporter well, had these or an Arab reporter sir, or a Jewish reporter. He's a reporter. Sir. And if I did it, I would be accused of making various remarks that tend to segregated thought. As if these reporters had not been so-called Negroes, perhaps they wouldn't have gotten in. There is oh, a that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Don't say it is. Now, let me read you something from, an org from a publication called The New Crusader. What is The New Crusader, Mr. X? The New Crusader is a paper that's printed in Chicago. Uh, in Chicago. It's a weekly. It's a weekly so-called Negro newspaper. It's your newspaper, isn't it? No, I it's mean, not. Well, when I say yours, I mean the Muslim... No, the Muslims... Uh, do not have a newspaper. Well, doesn't Elijah Muhammad write for the the New, New, New Crusader? Uh, Lerner writes for the Post. Is that his paper? Yes, you would refer to the Post as Lerner's he paper. He works for the paper, or he uh, has a column. Does Elijah paper. Muhammad work for the New Crusader? No, sir, Crusader? he does not work for but it. But he writes for it. He them. submits a column to the, right. uh, to the right. weekly Negro press across the I'm country, and those who want to print it, print it. Those who don't, Mr. Don't X, it. this isn't a trial. I'm simply asking you, a, I hope, a pleasant question. Yes, is sir. this Mo Mr. Muhammad's column that you yes, look sir. at? It is. Yes, All sir. right. He wrote it. He says here, the final war between Allah, God, in parentheses, and the devils is dangerously close. The very least amount of friction can bring it into action within minutes. There's no such thing as getting ready for this most terrible and dreadful war. They are ready. Preparation for the battle between man and man or nations has been made and carried out on land and water for the past 6,000 years. Man has now become very wise and has learned many of the secrets of nature which make the old battles with swords and bows and arrows look like child's play. Since 1914, which was the end of the time given to the devils, and in parentheses, white race, to rule the original people, black nation, man has been prepared for a final showdown in the skies. What does that mean, Mr. X? What do you mean? What does it mean? It means the same thing that all religion teaches. The Christian religion teaches you that there will come a time when there will be a showdown between God and the devil. Right. The Christian Bible uh, clearly states, and all Christians teach, that there will come a time when God will destroy all non-Christians. This is the Christian gospel. And uh, uh, the only thing now, and yet when they say that, Christians are never accused of being anti-anyone. They're just uh, uh, congratulated or complimented for being good Christians. Which testament are we referring to? Uh, and I think that you'll find that your uh, uh, theo theologians, uh, Mr. Gray, constantly refer today to the War of Armageddon. Uh, uh, Dean Acheson, when, when, when Douglas MacArthur was called back to uh, this country some years ago, when he made his speech in the Senate, he referred to the battle that was shaping up as Armageddon. Now, most, in most Negro churches, they teach Negroes that the war of Armageddon is something that's going to be fought between spirits up in the sky someplace. But Dean Acheson, who was Secretary of State, and Douglas MacArthur, who was the, one of the generals out there in the Pacific, he referred to the uh, war of Armageddon yes, as being right here on this earth between yes, God and the devil. Mr. X, I really wanted to ask a very simple question. Doesn't Mr. Muhammad, your leader, uh, talk about the battle between the black and the white, and isn't this the basis of his entire platform? He teaches us that God is going to destroy the wicked. Now, who oh. are the wicked? All you have to do is look around on this earth and find out who it is has committed the acts of a wicked man. Who is the thief? Who is the robber? Who is the enslaver? Who is the lyncher? Who is the colonizer? Now, if I point to a man and call, say he's, he's, he's a colonizer or he's a, uh, a, a lyncher, which is a murderer, or he's an enslaver, that doesn't mean I'm teaching hate unless I am saying that that man has done something that he hasn't done. And uh, 
what Mr. Muhammad teaches us basically is that God is going to destroy the wicked. Now, well, that, nobody has to worry about that except those who are guilty of that, having done wickedness. Does that include the Congolese troops as well? Uh, how do you mean? Well, the wicked, those who have committed murder, rape, arson, assault. I, I'm surprised how, and excuse me, how a white man who knows the history of the Belgian Congo or, or of the Congo. No, we're talking about moment. wicked people. Uh, yes, I'm surprised that you as a white man and as an intelligent person who knows the history of Belgian colonialization in the Congo and what they did, and uh, uh, I regret to say, Mr. Gray. Well, they did uh, bad things, uh, too. Uh, uh, and well, we're talking about the wicked without regard no, 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 to no, no, race. No, no. Uh, if, if you can put a man in the electric chair, for crimes that he has committed, and you murder him for the murder that he has done, then you're not wicked for giving him justice or repaying him in a just way for what he has done. Well, justice means the, uh, also includes the words due process. W and there's nothing due process about the, the, the marauding troops of the... Justice uh, is, due, uh, justice is uh, to balance the scale. Due process, sir, sir is justice. the words that have been used since the beginning of Anglo-Saxon justice. Mr. Gray, yes. uh, I think you'll find that uh, the Belgians murdered millions and millions and millions of Congolese. All Belgians. Uh, well, when you say, when I say Belgian, those who were in power over them plus You mean their, women, w women their... with five children conducted the murdering? Uh, or they just paid for the crime? Uh, I, I was at an interview where reporters asked uh, Mr. Wigger Mary, uh, who, who the Congolese government had, uh, had designated to uh, look into this uh, so-called atrocities by the Congolese troops, and he claimed that he didn't know, he didn't see any signs of it. Well, that uh, happens to be a flat untruth. Yes. But the I reports think from all observers, yes. including Mr. Lumumba, yes. have been fairly well authenticated. They're reaping what they sowed. The, 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 whatever happened the women to the, with five children. What happened to the Belgians in the Congo, sir? They reaped what they sowed. A man cannot do other than, he can't reap other than what he sowed. Uh, it didn't happen to the English. It didn't, the same thing didn't happen to the English when they withdrew from places they had colonized and didn't commit atrocities. Uh, uh, and it didn't happen to, the, to any colonial power that withdrew and did not commit these atrocities. You think then that the Congolese troops were exactly correct in their attitude? Uh, I'm not certain of what the attitude was because I wasn't there. And uh, uh, What do you think of Patrice Lumumba from what you've read? Do you think he's a wise statesman? Well, I will say that he is one person who has brought unity among all of the colonial powers in that they all dislike him. They all united against him. It also seems that the Russians dumped him today, too. Well, I, I see, the, all of this politics, which I don't follow too closely, being a religious man... Uh, I can tell. But at the same time, I'm interested in the betterment and the elevation of the black man. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a religious leader and a religious teacher who's not interested in politics. Aren't you interested in mankind? How do you mean mankind? Well, you said you were interested in the black man. I thought perhaps you'd be interested well, in all mankind. Mr. Gray, since when has the white man become so interested in mankind? Since well, I'm not, no, no. I'm not the spokesman no, for the but, but white see, man. See, I'm, only, I'm only the spokesman for this white man. Today, uh, today, or today, when I say today, in this era, the white man today all of a sudden has become the, the chief spokesman for, for humane acts. Mr. But X, you have, you Mr. Can't... X, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. With this country, in the last 180 years, has given birth to some great men who have undertaken to advance the cause of all peoples, including the Negro, from the day of their, their thinking and diplomatic activities. I give you Harry Truman, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin. I can give you a list that would take us the rest of the evening. You mean these white men were evil, the too? The first man that you mentioned and just uh, said that the sit-ins in the South should be arrested and put in jail, Harry Truman. That is not an, an accurate and exact statement, and Mr. Truman has cleared it up three or four times. You read the first statement. You didn't read the second. But let's go to the others. You mean these white men never thought of anybody Franklin else? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president of the United States for 13 years, and had more power, perhaps, than any other man that sat in that chair, and he was supposed to have been a friend of the so-called Negro, and the so-called Negro is still knocking on the doors of the White House today begging for civil rights, begging for civil rights. 
or whether it be begging it, begging for civil rights from the Democrats or the Republicans, he is still begging for that which he was supposed to have gotten when Abraham Lincoln issued the so-called Emancipation Proclamation. Well, let's talk about Lincoln as long as you give him a little credit. Do you think he was just thinking of the white man? Lincoln, according to history, stated that if he could free this, if he could uh, 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 stop this so-called civil war without freeing the slaves, he would. If he could save the Union by freeing the slaves, he would. He wasn't interested in freeing the slaves, sir. According to history, Mr. Lincoln was interested primarily in saving the Union. And uh, uh, today, many so-called Negroes who don't read into the uh, history or into the points of history that, that aren't included in the general history books take Mr. Lincoln as their friend. But if he set them free, why are they still begging for civil rights? To me, yes. civil rights means citizenship. If a man doesn't have civil rights, he's not a citizen. No do you have civil rights, Mr. No, X? No, sir. There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. Mr. X, do you think you could do this, 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 make this particular appearance on a broadcast, we'll say, in Mississippi? The yeah. Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught in interested. Atlanta, Georgia. No, I'm interested in your opinion, Mr. X. In Mississippi? What kind of a broadcast? Uh, like we're talking about right just now? just as you are now. Do you vote... If they allow you vote, it, Mr. X, you're getting too close into my personal business, which I don't. Uh, you intend. don't I vote. I do anything the Honorable Elijah Muhammad but, teaches me. But to do you or tells live? You to. live. You live today in the city of New York without fear of prosecution. You have the rights of free speech. I, I, I live. Freedom minute, of sir, employment. Sir, sir, please. And I hope the audience don't think we're arguing. But see, you're hitting oh, on. Oh no, some, we're just you, doing a no, great when imitation. You say, wait a minute. When you say that I live in New York City without fear of what? Uh, uh, we had a case where one of our brothers was beaten on the street until right now he carries a silver plate in his head. Mr. Two years ago... Mr. X, I was beaten on the street. I still enjoy civil rights. Two years ago, my my home or the home... I haven't heard the, anything uh, from you. Uh, ...in Long Island was shot up by, by uh, uh, police of the New York City Police Department. Was shot up uh, two years ago, 1957, or three years ago in 1957. They had no no reason. Well, they, they went to court. They, they went to court for two years and beat every charge that the, that the police department put against them. And now they have a civil suit in the, uh, in the court against the police department. Plus, the brother who was beaten there on 125th Street, he uh, was completely cleared of all yeah. charges, and he too. Mr. Mr. X, what do you think of Fidel Castro's recent statements? How do you mean, sir? About the policies that exist between Cuba and the United States. Uh, I th my impression of uh, Fidel Castro was that uh, he was a very he was a man who seemed to have the uh, genuine interest of his people at heart, uh, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has the general interest of his people at heart. But uh, we don't believe or follow or align ourselves with any outside powers, nor do we believe that any outside power can solve the. Uh, problem of the so-called Negro here in America. We who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I'd like to make that straight, we don't believe any outside power can solve the problems that confront the so-called Negroes in America. We believe that God will do it. Why did you rush to have an appointment with Fidel Castro? Evidently, you don't recall what I said earlier. I was selected on a committee by the, which was uh, uh, backed by the police department and by everybody who was at that meeting, the newspaper itself also. I can't recall any other dignitaries rushing up there today, except Nikita Khrushchev. What, what is your point? What are you getting at? I'm curious since, since as to I why you would seek out Sir, Fidel Castro. Mr. Gray. Why don't you visit? Go ahead. Now you can see why I took the time in the beginning to tell you how it developed. So you would not toss out the uh, impression that I was ran seeking anybody. When I went to the Hotel Teresa, I was summoned there by the, uh, with the knowledge and consent and the approval of the police department and the newspaper and the others of the Harlem community who belong on that council. Can you name anyone else, uh, any other prominent person who went to visit Fidel Castro today? Uh, Reverend Dempsey, uh, Mr. Powell's assistant, and who was the mayor of Harlem, uh, and, and uh, I think State Senator Watts, and I can name all night long prominent Harlemites who were out there, but they didn't get to see the man because yeah. they were not on the committee. Do you think Roy Wilkins or Thurgood Marshall is going to meet uh, Mr. Castro? Well, I'm not uh, acquainted with uh, them well enough to know whom they would meet. Are you going to seek an appointment with uh, Mr. Nasser when he arrives? I understand that you, you will attempt that as well. 
Who gave you that understanding? Just little birds flying in the <laughs> studio. They come in every night. Oh, uh, well, Mr. Nasser is a, a Muslim, and I'm we're Muslims, and uh, a Muslim always is happy to see his Muslim brother. If King Saud came here, I'd like to see him. He's a Muslim. If Sekou Touré came here, I'd like to see him. He's a Muslim. Any of the Muslims who come from the Muslim world, they don't have to be presidents, nor do they have to be prime ministers if they're, if they're just workmen on the boat. Uh, as a Muslim who follows the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, any time I see another Muslim, he's my brother. Now, let me ask you this, and this is just about all the time we have, Mr. Mr. X. Uh, here comes a Negro photographer, Mr. X. I'm glad you let him in. You're Up very... until tonight, he would have been just a photographer, but you've made it clear that there are certain kinds, so this is a Negro photographer. Well, the, most of the Negro photographers... He looks like a nice fella. Mr. Gray, most of the Negro photographers were put out of the Teresa Hotel last night because they didn't have uh, these official uh, working... Uh, well, passes. if you don't have credentials, you're out. But it, the I don't white, think it has a... The, uh, the white photographers were in. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, it, it's facts. The Most fact is that there were thousands of people who applied for credentials and only hundreds were given them, and I'm sure that the axe fell in all directions. But I want to ask you, I want to ask you uh, this, uh, this point. Do you believe, Mr. X, that in Nasser's Egypt... Or in Castro's Cuba, you could make statements like this? I was in Egypt last year. Uh -huh. I've never been to Cuba. But one of the things that impressed me about Egypt was, now I was in other countries in Africa too, and in some of the places that I went, it seemed that the, uh, in some places that I went, it seemed that the people or the leaders weren't thinking uh, as much of elevating the people as they should. But when I was in Egypt, what I saw appeared to me to be a mass movement to elevate the conditions that the people were living in. Did you that, visit the refugee camps? That is one place that, that it did impress me like that. I saw housing going up for people. The only country that I saw in Africa where housing was going up for the masses or for the, did you for visit the, the, for the poorer people did was you in Egypt. Did you visit the refugee camps? No, sir, I didn't visit they the refugee them. camps. But what brought they about these refugee camps? Now you're talking still going into the political thing. And like I say, oh, no, I'm, I'm talking, a religious man, a Muslim, I'm who talking, follows I'm talking another about, religious man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm talking about starving people, Mr. X. Sir, I didn't see any. I didn't visit any ref refugee camps well, they're in, there. in Egypt. They're well, there. they're there because, perhaps, by having been displaced by Israel, uh, and uh, that's another question in itself, another problem in itself. It would take us another half hour, yes, unfortunately. Yes, and, and I think, Mr. Gray, to say in closing, that any time a man who gets on your program and speaks uh, so well and so uh, militantly for Israel and for uh, the Jews having a home or a state of their own, uh, I don't think that you should be so... Uh, you should refuse to be as objective as you could be when you see those of us who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad trying to do the same thing that you believe that your own people should do, get something of their own. What we teach is no different than what the Jews teach among their own kind. I'm an American, Mr. X. Uh, my interests in Israel are strictly that of an onlooker. My interests lie with this country and its policies. My interests in Israel are purely secondary or even third. If this country I have an would interest, give me the I have advantages... An I have an interest in, this, in Israel as a democracy in the Middle East, a purely political interest, yes, none sir. other. Yes, sir. Go Mr. ahead. Mr. Gray, if this country would give me and the other black pe 20 million black people in this country the same advantages that it gives you as a white man, then my uh, interest could be just as profound in the uh, future of America. Well, but you I, just can't... Mr. X, I can assure you that this broadcast has for years and will continue to, as long as it exists, work for those advantages for you and other people. I, yes, I, I'm quite certain that you will, sir. But I think that uh, when the, and the, all of these, pres these people who are presently running for political office, and when you listen to the promises that they make, and uh, you yourself, when they, when they first uh, uh, developed as they did in, 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 uh, in Los Angeles, you were very disappointed because you, you, were, you didn't believe that the present candidates at that time would give the rights or civil rights or be as liberal uh, as, the, uh, as, as, as the one that you were for. But since all of that has come about, Everybody is changing now. They're getting behind this man from Texas and the man from Massachusetts and telling all the Negroes to come out and vote for them. And when they get through voting, they'll still be in the same condition or position that they were when they were promised by the other 33 or 34 men who also ran for office. Mr. X, we'll march at 1 o'clock. I have to make way for the news. I thank you very much for coming here. Malcolm X. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Who is a member of the Muslim group.
in New York and across the nation. Here's the news on WMCA New York and WBNY in Buffalo.